Welcome to the PowerShell and DevOps Global Summit for 2021. My name is Adam Driscoll, and today we're going to be talking about PowerShell Universal and building web-based IT tools with PowerShell. So PowerShell Universal allows you to build full-featured web apps with PowerShell. So you can do things such as building web uh, APIs, so you can expose your PowerShell scripts as REST APIs. You can also set up automations to execute and schedule PowerShell scripts. And finally, you can build dashboards or create a, uh, interactive web pages with PowerShell using Universal Dashboard. So there are a lot of features in PowerShell Universal. So APIs have things like static and dynamic routes, multiple verb support, and even rate limiting. Automation has the ability to schedule things, uh, integrates with the PowerShell pipeline, and you can respond to feedback inside your scripts. You can also run scripts as alternate users using run as support. PowerShell Universal Dashboard is a kind of evolution of the original Universal Dashboard PowerShell module and allows you to create interactive websites with PowerShell. So inside uh, PowerShell Universal is Universal Dashboard V3, which is an all new uh, framework for building new components with PowerShell. So we have a lot of new controls um, and it's uh, built on a new UI library that makes it really quick to uh, build out um, your dashboards. So that is pretty much the ultimate amount of customization that you can do with PowerShell inside PowerShell Universal. All three of these features are built on the same platform, which is the Universal platform. And because of this, you get a lot of things across the entire uh, platform. So you have things like authentication. So we support things like forms authentication, um, single sign-on and Windows authentication, as well as OpenID Connect for Azure AD or WS Federation for Azure on-prem. So uh, in regard to authentication and authorization, we also provide a bunch of role-based access support for your APIs, automation, and dashboards. The entire platform is built, built on a script-based configuration uh, system, so you actually can write scripts to configure uh, PowerShell Universal without ever actually touching the admin console. That said, we have a very nice admin console that you can use to actually configure Universal if you don't want to write PowerShell scripts directly. So I get this question a lot, what's the difference between PowerShell Universal and Universal Dashboard? So PowerShell Universal uh, is, first of all, it's architected a little bit differently. It's a standalone .NET Core application built on um, .NET Core 3.1 at uh, the current uh, moment. And it does not run directly in PowerShell like Universal Dashboard does. Uh, we changed this because of a lot of problems that we were having um, mixing in, uh, modules inside Universal Dashboard. So now PowerShell Universal will actually run the ASP.NET web application um, and then start PowerShell processes in the background to run your scripts. So it supports multiple environments, which means that we support both Windows PowerShell and PowerShell 7 in PowerShell Universal. And you can actually do that all under the same application. Um, it actually creates those PowerShell processes in the background, similar to the VS Code uh, extension for PowerShell. Um, it includes two different uh, dashboard frameworks, and you can use multiple versions of those dashboard frameworks. So you can actually upgrade PowerShell Universal without breaking your dashboard. It does have some job persistence for storing things such as job output, uh, pipeline output, um, and feedback that's been requested by scripts. Additionally, it has advanced scheduling and run as support, which weren't possible in Universal Dashboard. So as you can see, PowerShell Universal is just kind of the evolution of Universal Dashboard to include more features and allow you to kind of build a, a larger solution uh, based on uh, your PowerShell scripts. So the current version of this video is 1.5 um, while I'm recording this. Um, but by the time the PowerShell Summit uh, comes out, we should be very close to be re releasing PowerShell Universal 1.6. So uh, 1.6 is going to include the redesigned admin console. So we actually built this from the ground up to uh, use um, kind of a new architecture, so it's much faster. One of the problems with the old uh, 1.5 admin console was it was a very, very large uh, application, and over a network, it was kind of slow. So we re redesigned it, we've added dark mode, um, and a bunch of other little features to kind of make it uh, more consistent. Uh, we've also added tags for scripts. So now you can tag scripts um, with uh, particular you know, information to group them together. And we've tied that into our uh, enhanced access control for scripts. So um, the enhanced access control will eventually be throughout the product, but we're starting with scripts to allow you to actually assign scripts to particular roles 
um, and then have really granular support about who has access to edit and uh, execute scripts. And finally, uh, kind of under the hood, we've started to implement a plugin system so that uh, we can actually plug in um, various parts of the product. Um, and kind of the first place we're starting there is our database support. So we've uh, kind of built a plugin support for the database, and we hope to have SQL Server support in the next version. So that's kind of why we did that. All right, so that's enough slides for today. Uh, the rest of this presentation is going to be a demo. And we're going to be looking at PowerShell 1.6 today. Uh, at the time of this writing, it's uh, the beta version, but uh, there'll be a little bit more of a polished version uh, available when you're watching this uh, at the PowerShell uh, and DevOps Summit. All right, now that we've talked a little bit about what PowerShell Universal is, let's actually get uh, PowerShell Universal up and running on uh, my machine. So as you can see right now, uh, the current published version is PowerShell Universal 1.5.15. Um, but I'm actually going to be using PowerShell Universal uh, Beta today, the 1.6 version, because it has a cool new admin console that I want everyone to see. So there's a bunch of different ways to install PowerShell Universal. Uh, on Windows, we support things like an MSI install, a zip install, which also can be used for IIS installs, uh, Linux and Mac packages, uh, as well as Docker containers and Chocolatey. So you kind of pick your poison on how you want to install and run PowerShell Universal. But what we're going to be showing off today is the Windows MSI installer. So I've actually downloaded the PowerShell Universal 1.6 MSI here. And I'm just going to double click that. And what that is going to do is it's actually going to install PowerShell Universal as a service. Um, and then that will start up uh, when Windows starts up. So that took about uh, a minute to lay down all the files and start the service. So now what we can actually do is navigate to our um, PowerShell Universal instance, and that's going to be listening on localhost 5000. So if you just use start process localhost 5000, it will open your default web browser and navigate to uh, that page. And as you can see here, uh, PowerShell Universal is now up and running, and this is uh, the new login page. So what I'm going to actually do is log in with uh, the default credentials, which is admin, and then any password. So uh, kind of as we talked about earlier, uh, was that PowerShell Universal is broken up into um, several different features. Um, and that is APIs, automation, and dashboard. So uh, APIs allow you to create things like uh, REST endpoints that call PowerShell scripts. And we support things like rate limiting. Um, you can also uh, schedule jobs via scripts, um, set up those as schedules, and then uh, kind of dictate who gets to run uh, which scripts inside PowerShell Universal. Um, and then dashboards are our kind of uh, way of building web, web pages um, uh, based on PowerShell scripts. So you can have multiple dashboards running. Um, it comes with some built-in frameworks, so uh, the three dot uh, th uh, v3 PowerShell Universal Dashboard Framework and the v2.9 um, PowerShell Universal Dashboard Framework. We also include some components and you'll have uh, an access to the marketplace here for actually downloading even more components um, directly from the PowerShell gallery and using them um, inside your dashboards. Um, Underneath settings, you'll find things like uh, general configuration, tags, um, setting up different environments, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, access to the actual configuration files that um, PowerShell Universal uses to control the configuration of um, what you're changing inside here, uh, and then any security settings, so app tokens, roles, um, and authentications. So now that we kind of have um, PowerShell Universal um, up and running, what we can actually do is uh, set up the PowerShell Universal Visual Studio Code extension, which is something I would recommend you do. So you can actually get that from the Visual Studio Marketplace. And once that's installed, you're going to have this PowerShell Universal icon here on the left-hand side. And if I click that, uh, what it's going to do is it's actually going to go and um, set itself up automatically with your local PowerShell Universal instance, as long as you have um, pretty much uh, not changed anything. So uh, if you have the default username and password set and you um, have installed on localhost 5000, the um, PowerShell Universal 
extension will automatically connect. Um, and if you do need to uh, customize anything, you can always do that in settings. Um, underneath the PowerShell Universal um, settings here, you can set your app token and uh, where your server is. And this works both uh, local and remotely. So we're gonna be using this particular um, extension to uh, kind of configure some of the PowerShell Universal uh, features. So you get a good sense for how the PowerShell based configuration works. And we'll also be jumping kind of back and forth between the admin console to see things update or add things in the admin console to see how uh, it generates the code for you. Now that we've actually gone through and uh, configured both our Visual Studio Code extension and PowerShell Universal, I wanna go through some of the basics of kind of how the configuration system works inside PowerShell Universal. So I'm gonna do that uh, via, by creating an endpoint. So for example, I am on the API endpoints page here, and there's this table here in the top right corner you can click create new endpoint. So an endpoint is a URL that you can call um, that will invoke some PowerShell script. So I'm just gonna add a hello world uh, URL. Um, I'm gonna leave it as the get method and uh, I'm gonna leave uh, authentication disabled since I don't have a license installed right now. So when I click okay, uh, what you're gonna see happen is that it's actually going to uh, create this endpoint here um, and you can see its URL is uh, hello world and its method is get. Now if I come over to details, uh, it's gonna actually open up a PowerShell script editor here. And what I can do is edit this script directly in the browser. Um, and I'm gonna change that to hello world. And if I save that, uh, it's gonna save that hello world script. And I can actually uh, pretty much test it inside the browser by clicking run. And as you can see, it actually returned the text hello world. It also gives us uh, kind of an example of how to call this particular endpoint from PowerShell. So if I click the copy button here and come over to Visual Studio Code and paste that, you'll see I get the same hello world because I'm actually invoking that web request with invoke rest method uh, and it's returning the text hello world. Inside my Visual Studio Code um, instance here. In the top left, you'll see that I have APIs and this API is now visible inside Visual Studio Code. Um, and you can do things like insert the invoke rest method call here, um, as well as um, actually edit this file. So if I click uh, open endpoints.ps1, what you're gonna see here is that I have an endpoints.ps1 file uh, inside my program files directory. So um, PowerShell Universal actually created this file and it put hello world in there um, and it generates this commandlet for you. So the idea with PowerShell Universal is that we have this really nice admin console, but you still configure everything with uh, PowerShell um, kind of in a declarative way so that um, you can check these PS1 files into uh, source control and are, you can use something like git sync to actually synchronize with a uh, remote repo, pull these uh, files down, um, and then you have a PowerShell Universal instance up and running without having to like do any weird database stuff or anything like that. It's all configured with PowerShell scripts. So if I came in here and I actually edited this file, I'm just gonna put a bunch of exclamation points uh, and save that. I do not have uh, permissions because it's running as a service. Uh, you can also do uh, remote editing. So this is local editing right now. Uh, we also support remote editing, which will edit through the web API. Um, it just takes some configuration of this uh, PowerShell, or yeah, this Visual Studio Code extension. Um, now, but if we come back to our PowerShell Universal um, instance, you can see that it's actually picked up that change. So uh, we're watching the file system and we're watching these configuration files. And then anytime you make a change, we actually reconfigure that PowerShell Universal kind of feature. And then it'll behave differently. So now when I run this, you can see hello world is uh, returned with the exclamation points. And even if I run it from here, uh, hello world is also returned with the exclamation points. So that's kind of how the configuration system works. Works. It's a series of PS1 files that PowerShell Universal is capable of generating as well as reading to configure itself. Now that we've talked about uh, the basics of installation and configuration, I want to go through uh, each of the individual kind of features and get into a little bit about uh, each one of them. So we're going to go through APIs, um, automation, and dashboards. 
So uh, there's no way I can cover every single feature in PowerShell Universal, especially with Universal Dashboard inside a 45 minute session. But um, I have tons of resources on my YouTube channel if you wanna start digging in um, to some of the things that I talk about today. So in this first uh, segment here, I'm actually gonna create some APIs and show you how to work with them. So we're gonna do everything, uh, I think, inside Visual Studio Code here, and then we'll pop back to the um, admin console to kind of show off what it looks like there after we've configured some stuff uh, via PowerShell. So as you can see here, I'm actually using uh, this endpoints.ps1 file. And if, I, if you open it from here, it's actually going to allow you to do the remote file editing. So it's actually gonna uh, edit this file over the web API rather than trying to edit it on disk. So that'll allow you to edit like a remote server if you have an app token for it. So uh, in our first example here, we had a new PSU endpoint that just kind of returned a string. But one thing that, um, PowerShell Universal will do is that if you have an object that you want returned, um, you can return that via uh, the endpoint and it'll serialize it to JSON automatically for you. So you have to be a little careful about what you're returning because sometimes serializing to JSON is, can be a lot more data than you're expecting and serialization can fail, that kind of thing. So I would suggest to uh, pick your commandlets wisely and uh, trim down the data to only what you really want to return from the endpoint. Um, so in this example, what I'm going to use is the get computer info commandlet. So uh, if we save that, it's going to automatically create this new endpoint for me. So what I can actually do is click insert invoke rest method, and it's going to actually invoke that computer info command um, inside PowerShell Universal. So you can see I got all this information about my computer back. And that actually comes back as an object. So if I store that in a variable, um, I can actually access um, the various properties of this particular object, um, just like you would any other object, because it was JSON and it was deserialized uh, back to a PS custom object. So, um, in addition to using um, get endpoints, you can also send data up to the PowerShell Universal server via endpoints, um, and you can do that using um, pretty much the put or post methods are uh, standard kind of in HTTP. Um, and in this example, I've created another PSU endpoint. And what this is just gonna do is it's gonna echo back whatever I send up to PowerShell Universal. So the idea here is that I've set the method to post, so I have to use the uh, post method to pretty much uh, call this endpoint. Uh, the URL is hello, and then the endpoint itself is just using the automatic body parameter. So body is going to contain a string of all the data that was pretty much sent via this HTTP request. So I'm going to save that, and again, you'll see that I have uh, my hello uh, created here. And what I want to do this time is actually send some body information uh, up to this particular endpoint. So I want to go to localhost 5000 and you can see that uh, I sent up hello and it echoed hello back to me because uh, it used the body parameter. So whatever I put inside this string is just going to uh, echo back to me. Um, in addition to kind of configuring the methods and the routes, you can also configure um, the uh, a dynamic route. So the idea with a dynamic route is that you actually have um, a part of the route that is treated as a variable. So you can see here that I have a new PSU endpoint where we have the get method and process slash ID. And this little uh, colon in front of there kind of denotes that that particular segment within the URL is a variable. So you can have multiple variables inside a URL. Um, and in this case, I just have one. Um, they just have to be named differently. So if you name it ID, you're going to automatically get an ID variable passed into your endpoint script block. So if we save that, we should now see our new endpoint here. Um, and if I want to execute that, what I'm going to do is invoke uh, rest method. I'm going to call process and I'm going to get the current process. Um, so it's just going to use my current PID. And you can see that the current process is uh, PWSH um, for the ID uh, 1180. So it actually went out and used get process to look up this process and then return uh, the name of that process um, as a variableized route. In addition to passing in um, variables via routes, you also have access to query string parameters. 
So you can see here, this route doesn't have a variable in it at all. It's just process, yet it's still using the ID variable. And the way we can make that work is we can actually save this. It's going to create a new endpoint. And now, rather than passing in the um, process ID via the route, I can use a query string parameter of ID equals and then pass in the um, process ID that way. And you can see it does the same thing um, because it's also generating these variables based on any query string parameters you may put on your route. Um, finally, you have access to some of the other um, pieces of like an HTTP request. Uh, those include things like cookies and headers. So let's create a new endpoint that actually uses headers. So this is going to do the same thing, except that it accesses the header uh, array or um, hash table to get the value of the ID header. So um, now you can see again that we don't have any like special route parameters here, but what we do have is access to the headers within the method. So again, we'll save that. It'll generate a new endpoint called process headers. And then I can specify that via the headers parameter of invoke route request. So uh, we're going to send that in. And you can see PWSH is now returned um, from that method. So uh, there's lots of stuff you can do with APIs. Um, there are lots of other methods you can use, like get and uh, put and options. Uh, if we go back to our admin console and if we refresh this page, you'll see now that we have um, all the different parameters that were, or the routes that we created um, inside the PowerShell um, Visual Studio Code extension um, show up inside PowerShell Universal. So next up, let's look at automation. In the automation section of PowerShell Universal, you're going to find a couple different uh, pages here. Uh, we have scripts, jobs, schedules, variables, and triggers. Uh, we're primarily just going to be looking at uh, scripts, jobs, and schedules today. So the idea with the script is it is either an ad hoc or scheduled script. It's just a PowerShell script. Um, and what PowerShell Universal does is it integrates kind of like deeply with the PowerShell host so that you get a lot of cool features based on um, PowerShell uh, scripts. So Let's go ahead and actually create a new script. And what I'm going to do here is just create a very simple script that returns the services on my machine. You can see I have a bunch of different options you can set, um, things like uh, the name of the script, um, what to happen when an error uh, occurs, the environment to run it in, either 7.1 or 5.1, which I have on this machine, um, as well as to set tags and that kind of thing. But I'm going to click OK here, and now you can see it's created a getService.ps1 file. If I click this Details button, it's going to bring up the getService.ps1 page. On the left-hand side, you have a code editor that allows you to put PowerShell script in. And then on the right-hand side, you have those same options as well as a table for jobs and schedules that are associated with this script. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to edit this script, and I'm going to say get service, and I will save that. So that actually saves the PS1 file. And if I go ahead and click Run, um, what this is going to allow me to do is um, just run that PS1 file, just as is. It kind of starts out a PowerShell process. And now you're going to see that it is running the script in the background. And what you'll see here is we have a bunch of output. So on the left-hand side is uh, kind of what you would see in the PowerShell console. Um, we're using kind of the default uh, output formatting so that you see um, just kind of what you'd expect from get service. But on the right hand side here, you actually have uh, the pipeline output. So uh, PowerShell Universal actually integrates uh, with the PowerShell serializer and stores all these objects as PowerShell or CLI XML. And you can actually expand these objects to see all the properties and their values um, directly inside here. This also means that you can integrate uh, your scripts with PowerShell Universal to pull this uh, job data back. And then you can use these you know, um, rehydrated objects in your scripts. So uh, then you, know, you could get your services. And if you had a long running script that generated some sort of data, you could store it as CLI XML and then uh, use a different script to process that later. Or in this case, we're just kind of displaying all those objects um, as rich objects inside PowerShell Universal. Um, the other thing that PowerShell Universal does when it comes to um, PowerShell scripts like this uh, are integrating with the param block. 
So we actually use static code analysis um, to look at the script. And if you save a script with a param block, what we're going to actually do is create uh, an input form for you inside the console. So uh, I'm going to add this script here. And you can see that we have several parameters. Um, we have string, date time, and day of week. Uh, the string is mandatory. They all have help strings associated with them. And then we have different types. So a date time, system day of week, and a string. So I'm going to save that. And now when I click the Run button, uh, PowerShell Universal is actually going to look at this script and um, kind of give you this customized parameter dialog based on that script. So this isn't like a super new concept. There are lots of other um, things have implemented this, like WebGIA and Universal Dashboard, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, where you just integrate with the param block, and you can see that our help messages show up in these little um, tooltips. Uh, this one is mandatory. You can see that it's got that little star there by it. And then if I enter the information it's looking for here, uh, select a day of the week, and then run the job, what you're going to see here is that it's actually going to output those values. So I have test um, Tuesday. I selected uh, April 13th, and then I selected Wednesday uh, from the dropdown. So those were passed into my script as variables, and I could then use those to kind of uh, you know, adjust whatever my script is doing. So additionally, when you actually go to schedule a script, um, you can actually click create schedule here. And if I were to select the parameter script, you'll see that I have a lot of options for scheduling this script. Um, and I can do things like you know every couple minutes, every hour, um, every day at midnight. You can also get real fancy and do your own cron schedules, that kind of thing. But it also lets you specify the parameters for this script. So you could have uh, multiple scripts or multiple schedules of the same script with different parameters at different times and that kind of thing. We also let you schedule um, scripts with alternate environments. So if you wanted to run something in PowerShell 7 at certain times and PowerShell uh, or Windows PowerShell at other times, you could do that. Um, and finally, we do support run as credentials using um, the credential store inside PowerShell Universal. Uh, but let's actually pop back to scripts and I'm going to create another script that uh, integrates with another kind of aspect of uh, PowerShell um, hosts and that is feedback. So. I'm creating a feedback script, and I'm going to click the details of that. And what this is going to do is it's going to call read host. So what read host does is if you like run this in a PowerShell prompt, uh, it's going to ask you this question. You can type it in, and then it returns that value as a string to the variable here. So I'm actually going to use read host in this script, and then I'm going to pass the value of that to write host. So uh, actually, I'm going to save it first. And then I'm going to run it. And now the script's going to start up. And you, if you notice, there were no indications of like parameters that had to be passed in or anything. But now the um, script has kind of transitioned into this waiting for feedback um, state. And I'm going to click respond to feedback. And you can see here, this is the read host prompt that I actually um, hooked into. And now it's asking me to enter some, some data. This could be um, like, yes, I want to continue. No, I don't want to continue, that kind of thing. But I'm just going to say hello. And since we integrated with write host, you're going to see that hello is now output to um, the window there. So we actually use write host to write that back to the user. So feedback like this will actually pop up in a number of different ways. Uh, read host is one way. Um, the other way this could happen is if you have um, other commandlets that you are calling that require mandatory parameters that you aren't passing in, um, that could pop up this feedback dialog, that kind of thing. So it just integrates with the PowerShell um, like SDK's feedback mechanism. So anything that kind of requests feedback from the user will cause this to happen. All right, so uh, finally, I kind of want to show off a use of scheduled data. Um, so I am going to create a scheduled script. And we're just going to call this scheduled. And what the script is going to do is it's actually going to use another mechanism that's inside PowerShell Universal, and that is the server level cache. So the server level cache actually is kind of in memory inside PowerShell Universal. You definitely can use something like a database for this or you know a, a file on disk or something. But we also have a cache that is really fast because it's just in memory. 
Um, and it has a lot of bunch of options. So in this case, I'm just kind of using the default caching mechanism um, where I'm setting a key and then a value. Um, but you could also uh, have like absolute expiration times and that kind of thing, or a sliding expiration time of when that cache data actually is invalidated. So in this case, I'm just going to create a uh, schedule script that um, what it's going to do is set this string value into a, the scheduled data uh, key. So now that we have this set up, I'm actually going to go to schedules, click create schedule, and I'm going to select my scheduled script here, and we're just going to run this every minute, and I'll, I'll leave all the other um, values default. So uh, we're going to let that uh, sit there for a sec, and while uh, we're waiting for that to run, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go somewhere else. So I'm going to go over to my endpoint section here, and I am going to create a new scheduled endpoint, or a new uh, API endpoint uh, called scheduled. And that's just going to be a get. And you can see I created that scheduled endpoint there. And I'm just going to add a call to get PSU data here, or uh, get PSU cache here. So this is actually going to call into that um, server level cache. And this cache data is actually available throughout PowerShell Universal. So if you cached something in your schedule automation script, you can use it in your APIs, and you can also use it in your dashboards or other automation scripts. So if you have something that takes a really long time to populate and you want to store it in memory, you can do that with the PSU cache like this. So we're going to save that. And if we go over to automation jobs, You'll see that this scheduled script ran. So if we go look at four here, uh, scheduled ran. There was no output, but um, that's because we just put it in the cache. But now if we go over to scheduled and click details and run this, you can see that this particular script uh, or this endpoint returned the scheduled data of the script that ran. So it was run from job four and um, it was created at this particular time. So if we go back to where our jobs were, you can see I clicked on job four uh, and that ran that. And um, it ended up updating that particular cache. So that's kind of one way you could use um, schedules in tandem with APIs or dashboards or other scripts um, and use the, the cache to store that particular data. So there are some other features of um, automation that you might want to look into, like variables. Uh, variables allow you to create um, you know, variables that you can use throughout. Um, this actually should probably be outside of the automation section, as these variables are available in APIs as well as dashboards. Um, but it also integrates with uh, things like secrets. Um, so I can uh, s safely secure um, some credentials, so API credentials or a PS credential. And it uses the Microsoft Secret Management module to store this stuff um, inside the Credential Manager in Windows. So um, that's how it's storing those secrets. Um, and then you can bring them in as variables, and then you can use them for um, authenticating and services inside your scripts or your uh, endpoints. Uh, so in this section, we looked at uh, automation. And now we're going to dive into dashboards. So now let's look at the dashboard section of PowerShell Universal. Uh, dashboards allow you to create websites with PowerShell scripts. So you can do a lot with PowerShell Universal dashboard. Uh, there are scripts for creating forms and charts um, and tables. Um, you can integrate with whatever PowerShell module you'd like to kind of display data and interact with things like Active Directory or SQL Server, um, that kind of thing. So Universal Dashboard itself has been around uh, longer than PowerShell Universal, and we've integrated it directly into the Universal um, kind of platform. So you can create multiple dashboards in here, and each dashboard is, is its own independent process. Um, it can run in Windows PowerShell or PowerShell 7. Um, you can have your own authorization and authentication for each one of the dashboards and that kind of thing. We also support a couple different frameworks. So uh, by default, you're going to want to use the V3 uh, framework if you're just kind of getting started with PowerShell Universal. It offers the latest controls, and it's getting um, all the new features and that kind of thing. We also offer kind of a fallback version of PowerShell Universal Dashboard 2.9, which was the PowerShell module that's been around for a couple of years. Um, so if you are migrating um, to PowerShell Universal, you should be able to run your dashboard using that framework. 
Uh, there are a couple built-in component libraries as well. We have a charts library. We have the Monaco code editor, which is actually the same editor that we use inside PowerShell Universal, um, as well as a very, very kind of uh, feature-rich map component that you can use. Um, finally, there is the PowerShell Universal uh, dashboard marketplace is integrated directly into PowerShell Universal, and we'll look at a little bit uh, what that means in just a minute here. But let's go ahead and create our first dashboard inside PowerShell Universal. So I'm going to click uh, Create New Dashboard, and we're just going to call this Dashboard. Um, that is just a friendly name for the dashboard. To actually view your dashboard, you will uh, visit this particular URL. Oops. And um, you can also set it to the root. So if you wanted to just have you know, your localhost 5000 go directly to the dashboard, you could just do something like this. But uh, we're just going to have dashboard here. We're going to use the default environment, which is going to be PowerShell 7.1 in my case. Um, I'm going to select the latest PowerShell version, uh, PowerShell Universal Dashboard version. Um, and then we're going to set auto start and auto deploy to um, true. Um, auto start will start the dashboard up when the server starts. Auto deploy will um, restart the dashboard process anytime changes are made. So you kind of have control over that if you'd like, um, but in this case, uh, for kind of demonstration purposes, I'm just going to auto deploy the dashboard. So once I click OK, you're going to see that the dashboard is created, uh, kind of moves into a starting state. And if I click this view button, you're going to see here that my dashboard is up and running, and I have some hello world, I have a button, um, I can switch between themes, that kind of thing. And if I click uh, details here, it's going to take me over to how this dashboard is kind of like composed. So on the left hand side, you'll see that this is the script that I, I is kind of the default template script for dashboards. It calls new UD dashboard, um, you set the title property, and then some content. Um, in this case, we're setting some typography, um, text to hello world, and then a button that when you click it, it actually will redirect you over to the docs for um, Universal Dashboard. On the right hand side, you're going to find some information about um, the dashboard, same things we could have set when we created the dashboard, uh, as well as this log here that kind of provides some information about um, what's happening inside your dashboard script. So let's go ahead and start creating some dashboards. And I have some scripts I've saved, and I'm just going to kind of tackle some of the very common things that people kind of first approach a uh, universal dashboard with. Like I said, there are, uh, you can go very deep with universal dashboards. So I just want to kind of like scratch the surface here um, with some of the things that you can do. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new component. I'm going to add the charts component to my dashboard. And that kind of allows me to use any of the new uh, chart controls um, directly inside my dashboard. Uh, and I have a script that will do a couple things that we can look at here. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I am going to um, call get process here. Um, I'm going to sort it by CPU descending. So I'm going to get the highest CPU processes. I'm going to get the first 10 of them. And then I'm going to use the new UD chart JS commandlet to actually create a bar chart based on that data. So it's going to get the process name and the CPU and kind of create a bar chart based on that. Uh, so we have a couple chart libraries. This is the first one, which is the chart JS library. Uh, I find this one easier to use. Um, sometimes it doesn't look as nice, I think, um, just my personal opinion. But uh, you can customize colors and you know set borders and all that kind of thing. Um, but it is much easier to use than the other chart library, which is our Nevo chart library. So Nevo charts are just another JavaScript chart library that we kind of integrate with. And this example, what this is going to do is it's using a new dynamic region. So uh, within the page, my uh, web page, I'm actually creating a region that's going to auto refresh every five seconds. So all I'm doing in kind of this section of code is creating some objects with some random values, that kind of thing. And then I'm passing them into my new UD uh, Nevo chart um, chart. And that is just going to create another bar chart, but based on the Nevo chart library, just to kind of demonstrate kind of what those two look like. So once I save this, what you're actually going to see is the page will automatically refresh. Um, and, or it should, whoops. There we go. <laughs> uh, so now uh, you can see that my page has updated. I haven't done any like formatting or anything, so it's really big. Um, but you can see on the top, these are our chart.js um, 
charts. And for some reason, Dropbox is using the most CPU right now. I have no idea why. Um, then Explorer, um, my computer or my video recording software and that kind of thing. So you can hover over and see the actual CPU usage. If we scroll down a little bit, you'll see these are the Nevo charts. Um, and since they're in the dynamic region, they actually are automatically refreshing every five seconds. And it's just kind of generating some random values and then putting them on the chart. Um, and as you can see that uh, the transitions and animations and stuff like that work because uh, Universal Dashboard is actually using um, a JavaScript library called uh, React. So um, everything is React based and it kind of allows us to kind of integrate with cool things like this where um, animations work. <laughs> we actually have a transition component that you can include inside your dashboards if you want to kind of have better control of um, animations and that kind of thing. All right, so displaying data is kind of how Universal Dashboard got its start. Um, you know, charts and that kind of thing, counters and tables. Um, but what was quickly um, apparent was that uh, people wanted to use uh, forms for like entering data into their dashboard. So we also have a very, very robust uh, form library inside uh, PowerShell Universal or Universal Dashboard. And you can create forms using the new UD form um, component. So you can use text boxes and check boxes and selects and switches and that kind of thing outside of forms for other various reasons. Um, but the form component kind of wraps it up and do a nice little form that you can then submit and then take some sort of action. So in this case, I'm creating a text box and a check box. And then when this form is submitted, it's gonna pass the values of that text box and checkbox to the on submit um, event handler here. And all I'm going to do is uh, pop up a toast message, which is a little message box that pops up in the corner. So we're going to save that. If I click this, yep. So now this reloads, and that time it was successfully reloaded. And um, I am going to enter some information inside this text or this form here. So you can see I like have done no formatting. I haven't had any labels. I just created a text box and just a checkbox. And when I click Submit, you're going to see in the top right over there, um, depending on what I'm selecting, my little toast is um, changing based on uh, what I've entered. All right. But if you are a former Universal Dashboard um, user, you may appreciate the fact that you can do something like this. So we've kind of provided a lot more uh, functionality and ability to customize things like forms. And you don't have to worry too much about what all this is doing, but just understand that what I'm doing here is creating a form that has rows and columns, and I'm kind of adjusting the sizing and I'm adding labels and that kind of thing. And then um, I still have an on submit that's going to pop up in toast messages. So when I save that, um, it's going to reload my dashboard again. And you can see here it's formatted, you know, I, I set up two columns, uh, they have labels that I, you know, can click on and then uh, enter some data. And then when I click submit, it's going to pop up those toasts. So as you can imagine, people have done lots and lots of things with forms, you know, spinning up VMs, creating new users, um, you know, submitting tickets, all kinds of stuff. So um, the form functionality is really, really cool and really, really flexible. So if you're finding that like the automation stuff doesn't have like quite the, the functionality that you want, you can definitely use universal dashboard forms to, to build it. All right, so kind of the last thing I want to touch on in Universal Dashboard uh, is the extensibility kind of piece. Um, and we've had a lot of people building um, components. So recently I've been building a lot of components. That's why I'm listed here. But a lot of the popular components are built by other people. Um, and what we're going to do today is bring in this SQL component. So what I've been kind of focusing on are building like components specific to solutions. So I created a universal dashboard SQL component that allows you to um, integrate with SQL environments uh, in terms of like really, really robust tables. And there is even a query editor um, component inside this library as well. So you can like write your own queries and execute them in universal and actually hit the SQL server and that kind of thing. But what I'm going to show you today is the um, UD SQL table component that's included inside here. So what I did is I click, 
uh, I click the install component and it actually will use save module to store that from the um, PowerShell Universal, or I mean the, the PowerShell gallery. So it stored that locally. And now if you click components, you'll see that that, that file is actually stored here um, in my program data folder. And what I can do now that I have that component downloaded is come up back over to my dashboard. And if I click this add components button again, you'll see that I have that SQL component available. So I'm just going to add that to my dashboard and that effectively really will just like import that module into my dashboard. And now what I'm going to do is add some uh, more script here. And the idea with this particular component is it makes it really, really easy to integrate with a um, database uh, table that you want to display an actual table inside your dashboard. So rather than having to write all the code to actually integrate with that, uh, you can just use this component to do so. So this actual component is written 100% in PowerShell, so you can actually go look at it on GitHub and check out how I did it. But um, the idea is that I can specify a SQL instance, database, um, a couple queries for actually uh, the, the data that I want to show. And what happens with this SQL table is it actually executes everything at the SQL level. So rather than um, bringing all the data down into PowerShell Universal and executing it locally, it's actually um, executing it out in the SQL Server. So you can see here that this is querying a database. It actually uses DBA tools to do this, by the way. Um, and it is querying the database that's uh, locally on my machine. And when I do things like paging, uh, it's actually going out to that database and it is running um, a skip take on that table. So rather than bringing down all the data in that database, it's just bringing down the five rows here that are displayed. Um, and things like sorting and filtering and paging and you know changing the row size and that kind of thing all work. Um, and yeah, so if you have a table that has a couple hundred thousand rows, that would be the most efficient way to kind of display that inside um, Universal Dashboard. So there is a lot more to Universal Dashboard than I just kind of scraped the service on here, but um, it is integrated directly in PowerShell Universal and it kind of plays with the whole PowerShell Universal um, platform. So uh, you can use things like the server-side cache and variables and you can integrate with uh, jobs and that kind of thing. So. Um, I would definitely uh, say jump up on the docs and start playing around with Universal Dashboard because it has a lot of cool fun. So thank you uh, for watching my session today uh, during the uh, PowerShell and DevOps Summit 2021. Here are some resources for PowerShell Universal. Definitely go ahead and download it. You can play with everything that I showed you today without any kind of licensing. It's all free. Um, there are some licenses for various functionality, but if you want to get started, there's uh, no need to even give me your email. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have GitHub for issues. You can download from our website. Uh, our doc site is up on Gitbooks, and definitely jump on the forums if you have questions. We have a pretty uh, cool community out there with people building awesome stuff with PowerShell Universal.